thank you uh, for coming to this event on this uh, lovely uh, Winnipeg afternoon. It's uh, so delightful uh, to have our spring weather here. I'm wearing a spring suit and a spring tie. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I have come in from the lovely outside uh, to uh, uh, hear our wonderful panelists. My name is uh, Richard Sigurdsson. I'm the Duff Roblin Professor of Government at the University of Manitoba, and it's my pleasure to be uh, the moderator uh, for this uh, fascinating event uh, this afternoon. I would like to thank the Winnipeg Free Press and the uh, News Cafe for uh, being such gracious uh, hosts here. This is a wonderful venue. It's wonderful for all of us to be uh, in the lively exchange district and uh, you know can walk around and buy some vintage clothing when all of this is done uh, and uh, 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 be cool like uh, Winnipeggers are. Uh, I would also like to uh, uh, space, say special thanks to the co-sponsors of this event, and that is the uh, Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. Now, uh, th this is uh, a, a, a baby uh, of us at the University of Manitoba and the Faculty of Arts and the Department of uh, Political Studies. Uh, we're so delighted to see this uh, uh, take hold uh, with the support of the university, the support of the uh, uh, of the government of Manitoba, uh, we are going to have a powerhouse research institute on public policy here in Manitoba at the University of Manitoba. And uh, this is only the first, uh, if you haven't heard about this before, this is only the first uh, that you'll hear uh, of this wonderful institute, which over the next uh, several years is going to blow your mind uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful work that's going to be done on public policy uh, that will uh, uh, focus on Manitoba, on Canada, and beyond. Uh, and uh, special thanks for helping me organize this event uh, and for being such tremendous colleagues and really the inspirations uh, behind the Institute. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Rob er uh, Ermel, if you stand up, please, who is, uh, I had to double check, I always get his title wrong. Rob is the uh, Director of Operations. Uh, uh, of the uh, of the institute, so he's sort of like a COO, I guess, uh, of the institute. Uh, and uh, Donna Miller, uh, please stand up, Donna. Uh, many of you will know her from her outstanding uh, career as a federal civil servant, uh, and uh, we're delighted at the University of Manitoba to have her uh, as part of our community now. And uh, she. Uh, is the uh, executive in residence at the Institute. Uh, so uh, from these two and all of their colleagues, you're going to be hearing so much uh, in the, the next several years. So on to our panel. Uh, well, we have an exciting panel here with uh, uh, three uh, uh, experts from the different uh, sectors, uh, from academia, uh, from, the, uh, from the voluntary sector, and from government. So I'm going to just give a brief introduction uh, for, for each of them, uh, and then we're uh, going to go forward in the order uh, that they're introduced, followed by what I hope is uh, an, an open and lively discussion uh, with all of us involved. So first, uh, uh, representing, I suppose, academia, uh, Dr. Susan Phillips, who's the director of the uh, School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. Uh, she holds a BA from University of Victoria, uh, a master's degree in uh, geography from Waterloo, as well as an MA and a PhD from Carleton University. Uh, she's the author or editor of eight books, author of more than 60 journal articles or book chapters, and has presented, and I was blown by this, approximately 100 conference papers in her short uh, career, uh, which is still just beginning. Uh, uh, her research focuses on the evolving relationship between government and civil society in policy development, service delivery, and promotion of citizenship. In particular, her work concentrates on comparative analysis of the policy, regulatory, and financing frameworks that enable or constrain uh, the work of civil society organizations and philanthropy and the implications for public management. She's won numerous academic awards and received many honors, and I can't uh, uh, list them all. Uh, and at the same time, uh, she has committed herself professionally and personally uh, to community engagement of various kinds. So just to mention uh, a couple of, for instances, she's involved in the Regulatory government, uh, Governance Initiative, uh, the Center for uh, Women in Politics and Public Leadership, uh, she's been a board member for the International Research Society for Public Management, uh, for Volunteer Canada, for Imagine Canada. Uh, she has had an extraordinary career uh, and is uh, really the leading light when it comes to the academic study of the voluntary sector. 
So she's going to, she's going to kick it off for us. Uh, and then uh, practitioners, both from the voluntary sector and government, will follow. Uh, Martin Itzkow is the co-chair of the Manitoba Federation of Nonprofit Organizations. Mr. Itzkow was one of the founders of the Manitoba Federation for Nonprofit Organizations. Also, he's one of the founders of the Canadian Federation of Voluntary Sector Networks, uh, Civil Society Networks a pan-Canadian network of cross-sectoral, provincial, territorial, and local voluntary sector and non-profit alliances and coalitions. Mr. Itzkow has held a variety of senior positions in the government of Manitoba, in the non-profit sector, uh, as well as in the private sector. In recent years, he's also emerged as a leading expert at designing, convening, training, and facilitating community change. Indeed, uh, Mr. Itzkow has devoted his career uh, to making his community and the world a better place through positive engagement in social change. Uh, he's led numerous projects over the last years involving government agencies and the communities they serve. As well, he's become widely respected in Manitoba and beyond uh, for what uh, Terry McLeod, the uh, uh, host of our uh, morning radio show here on CBC, calls the science of leadership. In short, Mr. Itzkow is a successful social entrepreneur, a uh, social innovator driven by a vision of a stronger and more resilient community. And uh, last but certainly not least is uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Paul Vogt. Uh, it, it doesn't look like it because he has uh, retained his boyishness, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we're, we're almost of the same vintage. Um, and indeed, we're, uh, uh, our, our undergraduate and graduate uh, uh, careers overlapped a bit uh, here at the University of Manitoba uh, before he went on to big and great things, and, and, and I didn't. Uh, 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 he, he went on to be a Rhodes Scholar from Manitoba, one of the uh, members of the, 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 one of the greatest traditions at the University of Manitoba is that uh, uh, we are one of the leaders in not only Canada but across the world in producing Rhodes Scholars uh, like Mr. Vogt. Uh, and uh, he also did graduate work uh, in Princeton as well as, of course, at, at, at Oxford. Uh, and uh, his day job now is the uh, clerk of the Executive Council and Cabinet Secretary for the Government of Manitoba. I believe you are the longest serving clerk now uh, in, the, uh, in Canada, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know, a tremendous uh, achievement, uh, I think. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't, get, you can't get another job, you know? Uh, uh, that's right. Uh, 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 Mr. Vogt is also an educator and scholar, uh, a great friend of the University of Manitoba who has uh, uh, taught courses at the University of Manitoba, at the University of Winnipeg, uh, has been a regular contributor uh, in whatever way he, uh, he can to uh, the uh, understanding of uh, policy, the understanding of government and administration uh, in this province and around the world. Uh, it was uh, one of my great honors uh, a few years ago when I was Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Manitoba uh, to award uh, Mr. Vogt uh, a celebrated alumni uh, award uh, from a number of years ago. So while I know he has a whole long list of other achievements and awards, that one surely is the one that counts most. Um, uh, and uh, I would just like to say that uh, of those other awards, and it's uh, uh, noteworthy here while at the Free Press News Cafe, is that he was named uh, as one of Manitoba's Power 30 by the Winnipeg Free Press. Um, and he's, of course, been a, a great contributor to uh, the community uh, as an advisory participant for the International Institute for Sustainable Development, as well as the co-chair of the United Way Cabinet. So we have uh, a panel of luminaries, and I'm going to turn it over now uh, first to Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Richard, for that wonderfully exaggerated uh, introduction and uh, to you and the Institute for the invitation here. First of all, I'd like to uh, emphatically deny that our graduates from the PhD programs at Carleton University have systematically infiltrated the University of Manitoba. Um, at least that's our, our story and, and we're sticking to it, but it's delight, delightful to see so many of them again. I assume this is meant to be a conversation, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't give you a few uh, perspectives that, that I hope um, stimulate some, some discussion. I'm going to start off with the proposition that I think neither governments in Canada, at all levels in Canada, nor the sector itself have ever really had a, a vision uh, backed up by policy as to what a truly constructive, uh, 
relationship between government and the voluntary sector would be that's backed up by appropriate regulatory and policy frameworks uh, and financing arrangements. And if we look at other countries, uh, the UK, for example, where I do a lot of work, uh, we, see, we see much greater uh, articulation of what that vision would be. While the, the big society may have ru run into a, to a number of bumps, there's still been, over many years, a view of, of what that relationship entails. And I think that we've, we've missed out uh, on, on that big political vision, and it's had serious uh, implications for both governments and for the sector in this country, given the important advantages that such a vision holds, political advantages, policy advantages, and certainly advantages for the sector and how we deliver a wide variety of services. But equally, I think the voluntary sector has been rather complacent, and it's not driven engagement uh, to the extent that it might, and I'm speaking in broad generalizations here. I think for a lot of organizations, particularly the small and medium-sized organizations, it's just so much easier, given the demand, given the pressures, given the limited resources, to keep your heads down and, and, deliver, uh, and deliver services. Now, true, the voluntary sector has gotten much better in recent years at telling its story, at the number of jobs involved, the number of volunteers, the comparison uh, of the economic significance with other sectors as big as oil and gas and, and bigger, 11 times bigger than the auto industry. But that's an illustrative kind of narrative. It says what we are and, and, and what we do. And it's set in a broader and enduring and encompassing narrative of austerity that entails one of dependency and one of, uh, of, of reliance on government in terms of more of a dependent relationship, and it's all about the funding cuts. And I think that has created a whole variety of, of perverse implications. Take Bill 470 at, at the federal level, which was a private member's bill, actually one of the few that ever, ever amount to anything, that proposed salary caps and disclosure of all salaries for charities. Now, disclosure is a good thing, and a lot of that's required through the, through the T3010 process anyway. But the idea of a salary cap seemed to miss out by a lot of, of parliamentarians the fact that that would include hospitals and universities. And some of them are pretty big institutions that, that pay decent salaries and probably should pay decent salaries. But the whole discussion was rather stroppy. And it, I think it's illustrative of the fact that there are a, a good many, at least at the, the federal level, and I can say this since I'm not in Ottawa, uh, a good many people who don't really understand what the sector is. Another illustration is that the innovation agenda the, we're the sector that does innovation, has been taken over, it has been uh, allowed to, to dissipate to the social enterprise, uh, to social enterprise activity. For example, a recent study of Man Manitoba social enterprises nicely illustrates all that they do, but you kind of have to look at in the detail to figure out that 54% of those social enterprises are actually housed in charities. So the whole idea that there's social enterprise doing innovation, and then there's charity and nonprofits that do the standard old things, those, the, the innovation part of that agenda, of that narrative, hasn't been incorporated into this sector. So my, my starting argument is I think the voluntary sector needs a more strategic narrative, what we're for and what we want. And that's something that we're starting to see percolate in other countries, uh, the UK and, and the US, for example, and when, and Canada's been much more of a policy a follower in this regard, so what we see happening elsewhere probably shows up here uh, in a few years. So, so my first point I th is that I think the sector uh, hasn't had uh, the vision or hasn't had the story, the, the constructive narrative, governments haven't had the vision, and together they haven't built a collaborative relationship. But I also want to make the point that I think the environment's changing in some significant ways, and I'm going to talk about five of them. All of this is set in, in a, an environment of continuing austerity. We recognize that governments are going to have uh, continuing 
issues around financial constraint uh, for a number of years. But within that narrative, I think there are a number of uh, important factors at play. The first one is around efficiency and good governance. Part of what's changed in public management in recent years is that governments have taken a much greater interest in regulating the good governance of private organizations in both the corporate sector, all of the scandals, appropriately so, but also in the voluntary sector. We've seen, for example, the new regulations around charitable fundraising coming out of the Canada Revenue Agency uh, say a lot about what good governance means. And I think uh, that's something that's going to continue and the sector needs to get out ahead of it. We've seen the initiative by Imagine Canada to uh, create the standards program, uh, which is a list of comprehensive standards for, for governance, for financial management, for volunteer and staff management. I think this is an important, uh, is a critical uh, development for the sector. It's currently being piloted and I think the sector really needs to get on board. I think it is too important for the initiative to fail. Given that kind of transparency that's happening around good governance uh, before governments decide to regulate actively such, uh, such governments, governance, uh, the sector needs to be involved in that. I think the other part of the, the efficiency dialogue is about rationalization. We've talked about the fact that there's likely to be an, a need, a search for greater efficiencies, whether it's back-end operations or whether it's actual mergers. We've talked about that for a long time, but I think that, that is still very actively in the agenda. The public doesn't get it in many cases, why we need so many charities and nonprofits that seem to be doing the same thing. So either the case needs to be made or greater efficiencies need to be found. The second part of the changing environment is around effectiveness and impact, and the, just the expect, expectation that organizations can demonstrate and communicate their impact. Whether we've seen that in the United Way movement in, in terms of sustainable funding uh, has, is moving to, to different kinds of funding models that take impact into account. We see that in other kinds of foundations. Uh, we see that in the whole push for, for uh, SROIs, uh, the um, social return on investment gaining uh, momentum. We see that by much more activist foundations. Foundations are saying, we're just not gonna grant you money in the, in the same old way. We're going to be much more engaged in that. Foundations have a, a responsibility as well but the impact agenda uh, is still very much there. The third part is the, is the innovation agenda. We need to find new and better and different ways of doing things in many cases, whether that's social finance and impact investing, we'll see the task force, recent task force on social finance uh, play out. But we need to, to be able to look at more creative ways of doing a whole variety of things, including funding. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Recently, the, um, the YMCA of, of Toronto put out a community bond to build social and, uh, and public housing. The Moutard Foundation, based in Edmonton, decided that uh, over 10 years at a 4% return, it, it wasn't a bad deal, and it, it had a public good. So the Moutard Foundation bought the $1 million bond put out by the YMCA. So the possibility of the sector doing much more of its own financing is something that for many of the larger organizations has real possibility, but it's something that we need to engage a new discussion about. And there's a big role in government for that in figuring out how it can, can facilitate, encourage, uh, and enable that. We're also seeing much more creative partnerships with the private sector. You've probably read about some of the, the, the initiatives internationally that CETA's funding where you take some of the big extractive industries uh, partner with, with organizations like Plan Canada to deliver services. That's come under a lot of criticism uh, from some parts because there's a certain fear of, of working with big companies in that way. But I think it's part of the future and we need to think about how we do it well. The fourth issue is the whole open and linked data movement. We've, this is going to be a whole new world for us. Now recently there have appeared a number of third party watchdogs, charity intelligence for example, that's made part of this sector a, a little squeamish. And we haven't had many of those watchdogs in, sec in this sector in Canada. But that's only the beginning. 
So for example, we're working with a little, little company out of, out of Montreal where they can take the T3010 data, uh, the foundation grants, they're now looking at government grants and government contracts. So we can start to layer on and get an overall sense of the funding picture and, and look at the boards and who's connected to whom. And so while organizations used to think that they can control their information, now you've got a couple computer scientists at, at agile.ca writing programming uh, and they can just put it all together. It's going to be transparent whether you like it or not. And the ability and the opportunity that affords for governments, for, for funders and for voluntary organizations to really get out in front and use that, the open data. And again, I think other countries are far ahead of us. The UK, for example, which has a very explicit policy of, of open data. You take the, the Crime Spy app where you can get an app for your phone that looks almost in real time at crime stats across the city. So you know what's going on where. The ability to link data and to use it uh, is, a, is a whole new world. And I think uh, it's not something we should fight. It's something that we should have the, uh, really take advantage of. And fifth, the succession of leadership in the sector and for the sector. We've long talked about, I'm sure Martin has more to say about this, of the need to bring in youth and, and, and minorities into the sector uh, to, to really um, look at, 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 at succession planning. It's been a sector that's um, often depended on the leadership of a few key individuals. Uh, given the size of the sector, it's sometimes surprising to me how, how few individuals uh, have really mattered uh, in the sector, and they've been important, but we need to put much more emphasis on leadership training and education. At Carleton, we're creating a new master's program in philanthropy and nonprofit leadership, we hope. Uh, it's going through the review process because we think we need to recognize the credentials in that. So, that. so we need to give serious attention to that succession planning. But I think there's another kind of succession going on, which is in this sector, it's tended to look very actively at the federal level for, um, for its engagement, probably more than it should have over many years. But, that, but that's changing. The action, while it probably always has been at the provincial level, now I think it really uh, is in terms of the engagement at the provincial level. So we're seeing many, of even the national organizations that, that, that focused much more attention at the, at the federal level, trying to figure out how they engage, how they work with partners in engaging provincial governments. So there's a real opportunity there. But that takes structures, it takes uh, true relationship building. So my point is that there are huge opportunities, particularly for provincial and, and municipal governments. I think this entails several things. For the sector, as I say, I think it entails a kind of strategic initiative that is more than just telling what we are, but, but really uh, engaging that sector. Uh, it means engaging with politicians. It means helping public servants see the alignment, see where there can be mutual cooperation and, and mutual interest. I think it means in, in investing in some of the infrastructure organizations that can back that pro process. I think it means stronger leadership for and by the sector, not individual organizations in the sector, but for the sector as a whole. And governments need to do their bit in that. Uh, they need to see the mutual alignments, whether it's around communities and neighborhoods, jobs and employment, health care. They align with real policy and issues that affect real communities. Supporting social finance and capitalization, uh, enabling the standards initiative to really allow the sector to get out in front of that good governance agenda. It means to stop thinking about this as a con simply a contract culture and a contract issue, not to say that contracting isn't important, but to look much more broadly at collaboration uh, in new ways. To make room for open data and let citizens do, citizen organizations do some of that work, write the apps, compile the data uh, for government. And I think that needs to be driven from the top. It won't happen by individual departments doing that in an individualistic or, or fragmented way. There's, of course, a role for the media in this as well, which, given where we are, is important, but I, I won't talk to that. So I think we're looking at, at uh, engagement and collaboration in a whole variety of new ways of working together. And as Don Cherry might say, it's not rocket surgery. 
it, it doesn't take years to plan. It, it takes a basic uh, discussion, imagination, and then getting on with it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, um, especially with Susan, who, and we've worked together before over many years of working on the uh, National Voluntary Sector Initiative and a range of other things. I also have a connection with Carleton, just to let Everybody you know. Does. Everybody does. I actually was um, a member of the, um, I guess it was the Center for Voluntary Sector Research, which has now been amalgamated with another organization for whatever purpose, and I won't get into that. Um, but also, at the same time, Paul and I have a very strong relationship in terms of the last couple of years, and more than a couple of years, of actually talking about the future of the sector and how we're going to move forward. And in a sense, because of Paul's work, we've been able to actually move forward um, in a way that's unique in Canada, and I'll speak to that in a second. Uh, so it's, been, it's very important for us to talk about uh, the sector from a practitioner's point of view. But I also think understand our context in Manitoba, which is very different than what's happening across Canada. And that's what I want to be able to talk about today. If I can figure out how the clicker works. Which one do you press? That one. Okay, good. So uh, just to give you some context, which I think is really important, um, you may have heard about the Federation, you may have not. We've been at this for 14 years as an organization, as a group of people who've been trying to figure out exactly what it is about the sector that we want to talk about and how do we bring that issue forward. So 14 years ago, a group of us got together and started talking about how do we move the agenda forward. And in 1998, we came together and started to talk about, is there a way to actually engage the sector around its sustainability? And out of that came the Manitoba Voluntary Sector Initiative. And that happened three months before the National Voluntary Sector Initiative took place. We were ahead of the game, uh, which Manitoba seems to have a habit of doing quite often. We went through a process um, for three years of engaging multi-sectorally with levels of government, the private sector, and labor. We talked about what was the future of how we could actually work together to sustain the sector to actually strengthen communities. Um, out of that, in 2003, we signed declarations of support between three levels of government, the private sector, and labor. And then we went quiet. Uh, no one seemed at that point in time engaged and interested in how the sector can actually start to recognize its importance, but also how it could bring the sector together in a way that actually had a conversation that government cared about. It took us four years of in and out trying to actually frame the conversation. And in 2008, we started again with a conversation that seemed to generate interest from government about the labor market. That was the frame that seemed to get attention. And it was for the reason that I think, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, because you were part of that process, it was very much around the fact that government was starting to actually become very engaged in what were sector councils and the movement towards labor market information. Although sector councils in Manitoba have been around for 20 years, approximately 20 years. It gave us an edge in terms of starting to think of how we could actually talk about the sector in a, where, in a way that sector could come together and start saying we have something that unifies us. And it was with the work of the Winnipeg Foundation, the United Way, who came to the same table with all the various government departments, ourselves, immigrant settlement agencies, where we started to say we need to go further and we need to start to actually engage the sector about what we need to understand about its labor market. And our first survey was being prepped to actually take form, and there's a copy of it now in front of you, that actually gave us the first evidence about what our labor market was about. First time in Manitoba, in a sense, it was working nationally with the Human Resource Council, but we actually had some evidence finally to say, this is our sector. We had information before about the number of organizations, the various um, traits of organizations. We knew and we now know we have 8,200 organizations in our sector, 4,500 in Winnipeg, approximately 2,000 health and social services in Winnipeg, but we didn't know anything about our labor market. And now we know where we need to actually start to actually focus our attention. It is very much around labor market issues of recruitment and retention. It is about vacancies. It is about being able to actually understand the skills, the skills development. But ultimately, it's how do we actually strengthen our labor market, 
our skilled employees so we can actually deliver better service that's not just more effective but also accountable, very much in terms of what Susan's actually talking about. And so we move forward and actually by becoming a labor market organization, a sector council, we automatically became a member of the Alliance of Manitoba Sector Councils and were finally recognized as the 18th industrial sector of Manitoba. By doing that, I think it actually allowed government to start to say there's a new way of thinking about the nonprofit sector. Uh, not necessarily just talking about money, talking about the accountability, but now it's about labor market. And I believe very much it's focused on the fact that labor market issues are across all 18 sector councils. We're absolutely no different. However, we have challenges a lot of the other labor markets don't face, but we needed to start to address them. Now in Canada, and the context is really important, Quebec, Quebec is very much ahead of the game in terms of how they have framed their labor market around social economy. Um, I think Ontario through some of the networks are framing some of that discussion, but there really hasn't been real research locally around that conversation, except for the HR Council's work. Um, Alberta has an HR Council, very much focused on the same kind of work we're doing, and we can talk a bit more about that. And BC has started the conversation, but they don't have actually a structure to focus long term. So Manitoba is in a very positive position uh, talking about something that becomes really important long term and short term. As a member of the Alliance, and also because we actually had, I think, the years of government, and it was Paul, but also five ministers were engaged, and various officials of various governments, we actually started a process to talk about how are we going to name ourselves as being important as a sector in a way that the community understands what we're talking about. In 2010, we were named in the throne speech as a sector that the government actually identified as being incredibly important and recognized its value for the first time ever that I ever saw in a throne speech. And that's in terms of what happened across Canada, except for Quebec. The second part is the government also agreed it was going to identify and work with the sector in terms of three pilots. And the first pilot was actually a simplification of funding um, arrangements in terms of being able to actually um, be able to write proposals for funding and be able to solicit it. And in a sense, my word is a universal application model. The second part is how government could actually work to simplify accountability. Third part was actually to identify a multi-year funding idea and how that would work. And we're still in contact with government to figure out what does that look like, how is it actually starting to take form, and how do we work with government to understand how we can learn from that process together. And that started in 2010, and we're still, we're just moving on that process now, because government has made some changes based on the last election, and it's going to take some time to form it properly. But also, very importantly, from my point of view, 2011, the Minister of Entrepreneurship, Training, and Trade announced that they would have a member from the nonprofit sector who would be a member of the Minister's Advisory Council on Workforce Development, and we have that now. So we're in the mix of all the other labor sectors talking about workforce development in Manitoba for the first time. That's the only place in Canada where that's happening. So I, I do congratulate the government to move forward on that initiative. I think that's very, very important. And in terms of the work we're doing, we just actually finished a colloquium in February to talk about what our future is and how we actually start to engage in terms of what the sector is telling us that we need to act on. So I'll get back to that in a second. So why is this topic important for us? Um, and I think what's really important is that there really are I think four areas that make sense to us in thinking about what the future is all about. And that one I think relays or relies heavily on some of the points that Susan raised about how do we define ourselves vis-a-vis -vis government? What, what are we there to do? How are we there to behave? What is our role? How we even say who we are? What is our name? What is our sector? What do we call ourselves? Still not known because we use voluntary sector, we use nonprofit, we use third sector. So what is our name and how do we name our future without really knowing clearly about who we represent? Second one is that there, this topic really is important in terms of how government and the sector works together because we're also talking about the transfer of knowledge. And I think that's really important between government and the sector about the relationship and probably more importantly about how we've actually had a history of working together. And that is really important. We don't have a place that actually has demonstrated that we've collected that knowledge. 
And to some extent, what's really important from our position, it's not just for the officials of government and the sector, but it's also for future politicians to understand the nature of who we are and where we fit. Uh, and there's some real important issues that we'll be addressing in the future, plus our staff, our board members. But I think it's really important in the context to think about also future politicians and how they view civil society. And there's somewhat of, um, I think, a notion of what's happening in the U.S. that is informing us in terms of how the nonprofit sector and civil society is being viewed south of us, which may have an impact in Canada at some point in time. It's a concern. Uh, what I think is also important, and I think it does come down to the fact that without really um, defining it, there is a natural tension between government and the sector in terms of how do we hold ourselves accountable and what roles do we take on, and is it only in terms of how we actually are supported by government and funded by government, or is it more than that? Um, there is a real notion in our sector that some of us believe within the sector that there is a role for government as an enabling organization or set of organizations to support the sector to deliver services to citizens and others believe strongly that it's really very much around charity and that we need to actually work with donors and it is a charitable notion and format that we should be applying. There is a tension that continues to go back and forth and we see that in literature and we see that in terms of how some of our leaders see that as well. And there isn't an answer for that but ultimately is it around the different expectations and accountabilities of how we actually operate and what is our role in society to deliver services. If you think about it, and I think what's really important is to know that we are big. We're not just the 18th sector, industrial sector, but we believe in our research we have 100,000 employees. And we're not talking in terms of institutions, universities, municipalities. We know from the first research, 33,000 employees in health and social service community-based organizations. Our second deployment is taking place with next year, but we also know from other research, it's a pretty good uh, venture to believe that we're 100,000. Now, what does that mean in terms of being able to focus on our future and how do we sustain 100,000 employees? Is it going to be possible? Bigger question, how many of our organizations are going to consist in five, actually continue to exist in five to 10 years? We don't have an answer for that. We haven't had the conversation about loss yet, but we think it's coming in a, in a range of ways. We know that. Uh, the last point I think that's really important is for us to frame the future in terms of what we want to become and how we actually name our future is really important. Um, I would say in terms of our colloquium in the last couple of years, and we've been at this for 14 years, we've done a lot of research, um, we have a lot of evidence about our challenges, and Susan talked about them, I'm sure that Paul could echo some of them as well easily, but we basically said that's the past. What do we do about our future? How do we stop and focus on what our opportunities are? And how do we learn from the past? And I think that's very important. Can we do this together? There are, I think, five questions. And these are really, I think, instrumental in terms of thinking about the future. Do we see the same future for government and sector relations? What does that look like? Um, the past is the past. Can we continue on? Probably not. Second point is what's the structural relationship that we need to put in place and sustain beyond one administration of government. I do have to say, in terms of uh, the previous NDP government, the current NDP government, we have a direction. We have four years of continuing to strengthen our structure, our relationship. We have an ally that sees a lot of things in a positive light. Doesn't mean that it's an easy conversation, because there will be some difficult decisions the government will make in the next year, and we know that. But we have to think about what's the structural relationship that will sustain that relationship beyond one administration of government. Haven't had that conversation yet. And it's scary to believe that if there's a change in government, what will happen to us then? Have we been able to move forward with a sector council modality? Does that stop and does that reverse? Um, the opportunities to actually sustain the conversation about the nonprofit sector is also critical. And I think it really is that conversation, are we charity? What does the sector look like? How will government change? Where will our politicians be? How are our boards and staff going to think about that sector? What's the conversation we need to have? How do we frame it? How are we going to do that? And ultimately, it's about how do we harmonize these ideas and opportunities between those that are financially and in-kind supporting us, including the other nonprofit funders, donors, whether it's the foundation, United Way, or private donors. 
How do we harmonize those ideas? We are talking about labor market. Are they interested in labor market? We don't know. I suspect it's hard to have those conversations with donors. When we talk about vacancies, when we talk about the majority of our staff are women who are retiring poor. We know that now. We know the minimum wage for health and social nonprofits is $26,000. We've done stories on people who've retired who are retiring poor. What does that mean? Big issue. And we've had the conversation with Paul. What do we do about that? We're actually asking people to actually martyr themselves. That's the language some people are using to say that their commitment to the sector is to martyr to the cause. They're working with people who are vulnerable in need of services and they actually exit poor. What does that mean? Real problem. And that's something that only became clear in our research and now having the discussion on that. It's not as if we didn't know some of that, but we didn't know empirically, we now know. I'm not gonna go through this because some of the history is explained and, and I will be able to give you a copy of the slideshow. I think that would probably be useful be on, on our website as well. But it's interesting because that came from Peter Ellison's work who's trying to look at the structural relationship of government to the sector and that's the Manitoba history of government and its relationship to the sector. So we'll have that available for you. But let me just talk to you about what we do. So as a sector council, as a member of the Alliance of Manitoba Sector Councils, we do labor market research. We have a range of initiatives. So there's labor market research, and it's not just simply in terms of looking at the current labor market, but there may be other research that we do in terms of compensa compensation surveys. There's a whole set of surveys and work we're gonna do around skills development. So there's an LMI piece that we are still at the very beginning stage, um, but I think we're moving forward with the second deployment. And we have a working group on that, and I think we're moving forward very quickly on that one. Right, Sarah? Absolutely. The uh, other part that we focus on skill development, so we started, and I have to go back, in isolation of actually having good research, two minutes, quick, uh, we actually started to put some research or some skills development in place, and some of the examples are in place, but we are rethinking what are the skill sets of our sector, and that's happening this fiscal year. We also have uh, a focus on HR, and as it basically identifies, we're building mechanisms for peer learning, shared services. We also have a responsibility as a federation to look at advocacy and also building awareness, and we're doing that directly in relation to government, not just in terms of the current pilots, but the future as well. Our future, and just very quickly, our future and our colloquium helped us start looking at the future. We have three themes that we need to focus on building on diversity. We are not a diverse sector. We are incredibly weak in terms of actually walking the talk about of inclusion. The second part is, are we looking at collaboration, unity, and leadership? Exactly what we have to talk about. It's about unity of a sector and focus on the future of leadership. And then ultimately, the bigger conversation is we know there are limited resources. How do we take that as an opportunity for change? Thank you very much. Okay, well that's a formidable task to, uh, to go after those two speakers and uh, maybe actually I should, uh, in, in paying uh, some tribute to mo both Professor Phillips and, and to Martin, uh, get right to my punchline. Um, I, I think it's very true the way that both of them characterized uh, the situation we're in right now between the nonprofit sector and government is I think that there is an awareness now of the importance of that sector. Um, and I think it's, it's grown in a lot of places. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to feel flattered by Martin that uh, we're a little bit ahead of the curve in Manitoba, but I wouldn't exaggerate that. But I think actually the, the bottom line, and it, it, it involves uh, both of our, our speakers here today, is uh, we need to understand uh, better what is going on. We need more research. Um, we need more dialogue uh, between government, probably because I think part of this is, as both of you said, the, the self-identification of the sector uh, is, is a big part of this. I think we need a lot more dialogue within the sector itself. And then let me very neatly segue to, uh, to pay tribute to my hosts. Uh, first of all, the, the Free Press and uh, the News Cafe. Dan, I don't recognize you without your hel hockey helmet on, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but also uh, the, the policy for uh, the Institute for Policy Research, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the things that uh, the university has, has begun to take on uh, in, in recent years. 
Um, to my mind, and all of the people, Robert Ermel's here, uh, uh, Professor Miller, Professor Levisour, and of course uh, uh, the, the, the Duff Roblin chair, um, uh, Professor Sigurdsson, I mean all the people who can make this work uh, uh, and are going to be working on it are, are in this room with us right now. Uh, we also have uh, Deborah Woodgate who's done a lot of work uh, for the government uh, to, to try and uh, promote this, this concept. But uh, to tie these two ideas together, um, you know, any institute has to establish its, its niches, and I think this area, which is so important and yet so understudied, uh, and, and my, one might say un misunderstood even by people who are, who are working within it, I think is it's a perfect niche uh, project for, for the institute to focus on. Now, let me just, uh, I think that uh, I always feel like a bit of a dilettante uh, getting up as government guy after people who live and breathe a subject uh, uh, have given their reflections. And they actually said a lot of what I was going to say, so I'll, I'll try and be fairly quick and then, and then just step out of the way for, uh, to allow for questions um, uh, from people who really, really do know their stuff. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk a little, well, actually, I'll, I'll give you a little quick roadmap. I'm going to talk about the importance of this sector in a, from a Manitoba perspective, and I really want to emphasize the importance at this particular time. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about some of the challenges uh, that we've heard uh, in government uh, from people who work in the sector, and then finally talk about um, some of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, Martin's already alluded to a few of them, and, and also I think what, what some of the next steps are. Um, in terms of the importance uh, of the sector, uh, our, our calculations, and these probably come from the research done by Professor Phillips, uh, by Martin himself, is that uh, the, the, the total um, uh, funding for the, se for the nonprofit sector in Manitoba is somewhere between three and a half and four and a half billion dollars. And that's commensurate, of course, with the statistic that Martin gave us that uh, employment would be around 100,000. So, uh, you know, it was really Martin who, who promoted the idea that that this sector has to start thinking of itself as a sector. It's, it's bigger than aerospace, it's bigger than agriculture. Um, and once you start to think along those lines, then I think a lot of these things that are now surfacing um, become much more evident, in fact, almost you know, self-evident, is why aren't we thinking uh, about what perpetuates it, about the challenges that people face in this sector. Um, but to add to that, of course, uh, as we're all aware, it, it, nonprofit organizations are huge parts of the quality of life uh, in, in Manitoba, and they're very much relied upon by government to deliver services in health, uh, in education, uh, environmental policy, uh, culture. Uh, I mean, you, you, you all will know from your own involvements uh, just how much you do, uh, in, or how much your, the organizations that you're involved with do, uh, to, to provide services uh, to Manitobans, which otherwise would probably fall to government uh, as, as a you know, sole provider under the, the traditional model. So in a sense, um, the, the nonprofit sector uh, extends uh, the reach of, of what citizens can do um, because it, it's not just going through government, uh, it's, uh, it's actually it's something that, that bubbles up from the grassroots, uh, often stays very close to the, to the grassroots, and I think therefore is, is often more effective than what, uh, what government agencies can do on, on, on our, as they call it, the traditional model. And that's, a, you know, that's a, an incredibly important part uh, of, of what happens in this community and, and also sometimes what doesn't happen if, if you know, the, the gaps aren't, aren't filled in by either government or, or the, the nonprofit sector. Um, now, at, at this point in time, uh, before I start talking about the challenges, uh, just let me say, I think uh, right now the nonprofit sector in our province uh, is diverse, uh, it's dynamic, um, it, uh, it actually is, is entrepreneurial and innovative. I'm glad that Professor Phillips uh, touched on this. Uh, from the government perspective, and I think the, in, in, in Britain they used, under Blair, you, they started to develop quite a bit of language looking at what they call joined up government. As I said, from the government perspective, uh, the nonprofit sector extends the reach of what we can do. Uh, it, it leverages, uh, you know, it's true that we, we do quite a bit of funding for, for nonprofit sectors. I think about half of the, the funding that's raised is government, and most of that is provincial government. Um, but for that, uh, we enlist uh, all kinds of volunteer energies, uh, resources, um, the, the, the governance role itself uh, of volunteer boards that are usually in charge of, uh, of non-government organizations. So there's a sense in which um, it's, it's another, you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of extended arm uh, of, of the public sector. Now, and, and, and I think that it's also very important, uh, since uh, Professor Phillips talked about innovation, uh, to realize that uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the state organizations on the traditional model, 
uh, if you provide a narrative uh, in historical terms, uh, most of the institutions that have now become part of the, you know, the standard uh, sort of array of government uh, organizations started out as community organizations on the nonprofit model. So hospitals, uh, universities, uh, schools, uh, all through the province, uh, gradually became absorbed into the, the public sector proper. But I think that that, that narrative uh, is still going on. And anywhere that there's uh, an area where um, you know, government hasn't quite got it right, or, or I mean, uh, sociologists sometimes talk about the, the big sticky problems. Uh, you know, I, mean, I mean, you just have to look around you to, to know what they are in our society. Uh, the underclass uh, issues of, of children uh, uh, who, who don't get a proper education and are disadvantaged for, for most of their lives, the, the issue of the Aboriginal population in, in Manitoba. Uh, what you find is that there's a tremendous amount of innovation and, and different models or approaches uh, to delivering services or addressing the problem that are being carried out by, by nonprofit sectors. And, and there's sort of a narrative in which, in a lot of cases, uh, when something has been proved to, to work um, by an, an, an entrepreneurial non, uh, uh, nonprofit group, uh, people who are very close to the grassroots, uh, government will try and, and, and scale it up. And so the whole model of mentoring, for example, uh, you know, dealing with youth and, and uh, with some of the issues in the Aboriginal population, um, very much uh, an innovation uh, pioneered uh, by people within the nonprofit sector, increasingly now taken up and funded um, by government uh, as just part of the array of, of government services. Um, now, having said that, though, what are, what are the challenges? Um, Martin's alluded to, to quite a few of them, and, and of course, because of our reliance on, on nonprofit uh, organizations, uh, we're almost reminded on a daily basis uh, in government of, of what some of the challenges are. Um, a lot of the organizations that we're talking about are small organizations, and right off the bat, uh, there's a continual problem with, with capacity, uh, to some extent with recruitment, but it's also, um, as, as Martin said, it's, it's a problem uh, that you'll get in any small organization of relying uh, on a leadership group, sometimes an individual, uh, as your animating force, and not being able to address uh, issues of, uh, of uh, recruitment, um, of providing the full uh, range of services uh, that are needed, and even, uh, as, I'll, as I'll get to, in dealing with your main funders, um, with, your, with your other organizations, uh, you know, especially government, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that expects to have a certain standard of compliance uh, with, say, financial accounting methods and so on um, as, as, as uh, in, in return for funding. Um, secondly, uh, and I don't think that uh, this was touched on, but an aspect of that, uh, the, the demographics in the nonprofit uh, uh, world are very similar to the way they are for government, except a little bit more worrying because you don't have, you know, the, that stable structure of, of, uh, of salary and, uh, and recruitment agencies, uh, a tremendous number of organizations in our community uh, are seeing the, the really dominant uh, people age out, um, and they're not picking up uh, the people from, from the, you know, the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings to replace those, uh, those people who, in some cases, had founded or been a, a major part of the development of organizations. And that's something that we see and hear um, uh, on, on a regular basis uh, with, within government. And then finally, um, and this, uh, this is one where we'll get into a bit of a sticky area, uh, there's the relationship to government itself. Um, a lot of nonprofits, and Martin talked about it, there's this, you know, in fact, this actually might be a, you know, become the, the real theme of, of questioning afterwards. There's a very delicate dance that's done. Um, nonprofits, I think, to retain their identity need to be apart from government. And yet, in many cases, uh, government funding uh, is absolutely critical to their, to their existence, especially once they reach a certain level of scale. Um, so on, on the government side, uh, I think we have a, a challenge that any government money has to be accounted for uh, in, in, in very standard ways. And uh, there's also a political accountability, which sometimes brings home the reality that uh, uh, if something goes wrong in an agency which is funded um, by, by the government. Uh, it doesn't matter that, uh, that there was this arm's length relationship or, or in fact even that the organization had quite, had quite deliberately asserted their autonomy. Um, the minister responsible for that department is instantly the person uh, responsible for answering questions uh, and for any kind of investigation or follow up that takes place. And what, what that's meant in a couple of cases that are very familiar to probably some of the reporters here and, and to people in Manitoba, um, we've had auditors reports 
which, and I, I, there's never been a, I don't think there's anyone from the auditor's office here, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's any, uh, there's ever been an auditor's report, at least not in my experience, uh, that uh, has concluded that uh, there's too little oversight, or there's too much oversight um, in, uh, in over, over uh, the spending of public money. And perhaps we could uh, just, you know, ease the, uh, the, the paperwork a little bit, uh, maybe sort of, you know, de deploy some people who are doing accounting to the front lines and so on. Every single report uh, has resulted in tightening up uh, reporting restrictions, in hiring more people, uh, to do accounting, and and, and there's been a, a steady ratcheting up, which I think has been become a real burden uh, for the uh, the nonprofit sector. The red tape burden, the fact that particularly if you're a small organization, so much of your time uh, gets tied up with with filling out forms, and then on top of that, and this is where there's a, a little bit of a mea culpa. I can't I can't entirely blame uh, uh, the auditor's office. Um, we have a, a challenge with the nonprofits in that it's, everything is non-standard. Um, these organizations reflect the communities they came out of. Uh, it's very much a part of their identity, actually, that they are, they have their own personality, um, that they, you know, they, they do things uh, in, in a particular way, which makes sense to, uh, to the people who have formed them. Uh, on the other side of that uh, divide, government uh, is organized in our Westminster system very much in a set of silos. Uh, in which each minister is responsible for their particular area. Uh, it's almost like a distinct kind of bureaucracy uh, develops within each, uh, each department and, and often has different standards as well. So you're actually, it's not, you, it's not entirely a matter of the, 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 the nonprofit sector, but government itself uh, has many different kinds of paperwork, uh, many kinds of forms to fill out. Um, and and uh, as I said, uh, from, from our side, uh, we're also trying to standardize uh, relationships, reporting, and accountability um, you know, with a very non-standard uh, set of actors. So um, what have we done that, uh, uh, to try and address that? Uh, uh, Martin already talked about a few of the things, and uh, uh, this is not, you know, I'm not pretending we're too far ahead of the curve because it only was last year that we really started to try and tackle this in, in a systematic way. Um, but we are trying to work um, with, with nonprofits, particularly the ones that um, we become most comfortable with, uh, to get into a multi-year funding framework, to ease the, the, the regular sort of cycle of annual uh, applications for funding, uh, annual reports, and so on. And so we've chosen, uh, I think it's 32 it's a organization, 35 altogether. Um, and actually, we've, we've now pretty much completed that uh, after making the commitment to, uh, to work with that pilot. Uh, we also committed that um, we would try and help organizations establish an online uh, portal uh, where they could essentially register all of the information about the organization that would be of interest to funders. And that, that, that portal would then be accessible. It's not, it's not interactive, but it, it allows uh, the organizations to control that posting and also not to reduplicate uh, all the effort that goes into to making all of the, uh, the applications that they have to. Uh, and finally, we've tried to move with mixed success towards one common application uh, for nonprofits for, for government funding. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, the other two, I think we're, we are pretty much there, but I think uh, we, have, we have quite a bit of work to do. Um, now, in terms of next steps, this, this isn't uh, you know, really more than scratching the surface and trying to identify a sector, which I think, is, as Martin and, and Professor Phillips both said, is just starting to recognize itself as a sector. Um, but I think um, there's a lot more that could be done uh, in terms of uh, allowing organizations or providing the means for them to pool services, and particularly services that we as government insist on, things like accounting services, leadership training, and so on. And I think you know, we're, we're fortunate that we do have some large organizations, including the United Way as a kind of umbrella organization, uh, that are willing to work um, and, and do, in fact, work and have a very strong relationship with, with a lot of nonprofits and could be the place or the site where, where those kinds of services uh, are, are developed. And I think that could actually go a long way to addressing the burden of, um, uh, that, that we impose on, on the, uh, the nonprofits. It could also do a lot of what Professor Philip mentioned is actually bring nonprofits together and start to encourage you know, that kind of common identity that leads to um, diagnosing uh, what are their common challenges and, uh, and, and how, could they, how can they work together and one, or use one voice to, uh, to raise them. Now, let me just uh, end though on a, like I said, a, um, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a dance here and I think we all have to be very, very careful about it. Um, I think from a government perspective, uh, as I said, nonprofits are a huge part of the quality of life. 
And I think not just for the services they provide, it's also the fact that uh, participation in a nonprofit is a you know is an element of civic participation, and and you know we know the differences uh, between societies which have a high level of civic participation, and where there's a sense that you actually do have uh, the ability, the resources that you can muster from the community to to attend to the uh, to the community's own needs. So there is a very broad interest in government in promoting this sector, even beyond the somewhat selfish interest that in these times of constraint. Uh, and, and I might dare say too, also suspicion of, of, of uh, government or a, uh, a poor image of government, uh, that actually using uh, uh, nonprofits to deliver uh, vital services is, is, is appealing in and of itself. But so, so there's a whole lot of reasons for government to want to promote uh, the sector, and I think that uh, in turn, uh, in return, the, the, the nonprofit sector can ask of government that you make our lives easy, that you do things to nurture us. But I think there's also that that difficulty that that relationship has to somehow preserve the independence uh, and identity of, of the nonprofits. Uh, when I was in grad school, we used to talk about models of corporatism uh, in that uh, practiced in South America and some uh, European countries where you have a lot of different organizations, but actually if you scratch them, uh, you'll find that actually they really are just state organizations underneath. And I think that that's something that's just instinctively uh, people in the nonprofit sector don't want to have happen. Uh, they don't want to simply be uh, a means by which uh, the state uh, delivers services, and, and they don't want to have a relationship uh, which is entirely controlling. So uh, without saying too much more about it, uh, I just want to end on that note. I think that there's a lot that government can do, and, and, and it's been great to, to have had the input uh, of Martin and, and people in, in the nonprofit sector to, to nurture it. But, but I also think there's um, somewhere or other there's a line uh, that, uh, that we don't want to cross. And I think we have to be very, you know, very conscious of that as well. And I think probably the nonprofit sector uh, would also want to, to sort of advertise that uh, there's a point at which uh, standardization and uh, nurturing uh, goes beyond and, and becomes somewhat controlling. And then you lose the entrepreneurial, innovative, you know, community uh, roots uh, aspect of the, of the nonprofit sector. So I'll stop there. Thanks.